Fresh Air Production. Hello and welcome to Fresh Ears. I'm Neil Cowling, the founder of Fresh Air Production, and we're the UK's leading producer of podcasts for brands. In this series, we look to see what we can learn about making branded podcasts by talking through one of the projects that we've completed with the producer and with the client. We talk about why they got into podcasting in the first place, the choices they made along the way, and how they judged it to be a success. We also, of course, talk about those bumps in the road. Radio DJ link coming up. But today, we're not talking about roads, but train tracks, as we explore Lives on the Lines, a podcast series for Greater Anglia. In this series, our producer turned presenter to navigate her way around the branch lines of East Anglia and speak to the wonderful people she met along the way. Generations would have the same names passed down, wouldn't they? They would, yes, like like West and Peg. They would sometimes have the same first name and therefore they would develop nicknames. <laughs> Those nicknames varied greatly. Pongo. Pongo. Um, you had Teapot. I can see them now. <laughs> Poor old Teapot. So why would a train company create a podcast as a piece of owned content? Joining me to talk this through are Kerry Worrell, the PR consultant on behalf of Greater Anglia Media Team and our client on this project, and Catherine Kerr, our brilliant senior producer for Fresh Air. So, Kerry, let's start with you and let's ask the obvious question of why would Greater Anglia go for a podcast? Why was that the piece of content that you decided to create? Um, Well there was a couple of reasons really. Firstly that we'd done some research and discovered that podcasts were gaining in popularity and then with the arrival of the pandemic a lot of our planned activity in regards to making videos, holding events and other, other things that we'd normally do from a promotional point of view, all of a sudden we couldn't do. So we had spare budget and some time to fill and thought that as it was something that we'd been interested in for a while, it could be a good way to kind of fill that communications gap, uh, try something new and kind of experiment and, and see how it would go down you know, with our customers and with, with people more widely in the region. And so did you have clear objectives that you wanted to achieve from the start of the podcast or was it more of as you say a sort of experimental piece of content no absolutely we had clear objectives because one of the things we thought was really good about the podcast format was it was something that we could use to reach people during lockdowns we were seeing that the podcast popularity was absolutely soaring so we, we thought it would be a really good way to kind of present some of our beautiful scenic branch lines to people while they couldn't travel and kind of give them that seed of this is something you might like to do when you can travel again but then equally we thought they'd have a longevity that that would mean that when restrictions were lifted, we could then use the podcast in a different way, almost as a guided audio tour that people could even listen to while they were travelling those lines. And so just explain to us the uh, the branch lines and the community rail partnerships. How, how do those relationships work? What are they to start with? So we operate all the um, train services in East Anglia, but on some of our rural branch lines, we also work in partnership with and we fund community rail partnerships and their organisations comprised of ourselves as the train operator, local authorities, county councils, other interested stakeholders who are interested in uh, improving that link between the railway and the communities that they serve and so the community rail partnerships really kind of work with the community to drive improvement to do projects that benefit the community actually on stations and on platforms so they might work with local people to turn a redundant building into something that the community needs or they might uh, create station gardens Uh, they might grow things on the station gardens that the community can use they do lots of outreach work into schools and other organizations so they are fantastic organisations the community rail partnerships and they work really hard to promote the rural branch lines to keep them thriving to make sure that they are serving the needs of of those communities that are around them and kind of bring people to the railway but also make sure that the railway is giving something back as well and so people might assume that a podcast created by greater anglia would be for sort of train nerds for want of a, a better phrase train enthusiasts that wasn't the case here. Who who did you have in mind as the target listener? Who did you really want this to appeal to? The podcasts were made in partnership with our community rail partnerships. What we really wanted to bring out was that our branch lines are 
really scenic, really beautiful, a really nice way to travel and to see the region. But also there is that real community feel and that real community input into those lines. So we wanted to bring out not only the lines and what you can do and see, but also the people that make the place special as well. That was our kind of focus. And we wanted to just create a kind of a snapshot of this really, these really special places and these really special people and kind of present that to people in East Anglia, sort of let them know about the history of the area as well and, and just kind of encapsulate really what the lines are all about. Lovely. So Catherine, as producer... You also became presenter of this series, which I'm pretty certain is the only series that we've made for a brand where the producer has crossed the line into also presenting it. It's fair to say this was a bit of a dream project for you and a, and a passion project as well, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, especially given the timing as well. It was it was a real, you know, after we'd spent however long in lockdowns to be able to, because it didn't start out as the plan that we would go to the places, but we just felt if we wanted to convey what Kerry was saying, the kind of community feel and the sense of place so strongly, we wanted to have people recording locally. You know, it didn't start out obviously with us saying that we would send someone down there in that period after the first lockdowns when it seemed things would be opening up there was still a lot of uncertainty but as it evolved I mean when you start to talk about a project in the early stages you think regardless how big can it be and you try to think how you do this if all the logistical things were no object and so I think what we kind of had in mind when we were throwing ideas around initially was that we could first I think Kerry's idea was we could get people locally to record things and send them in and then it kind of evolve from there into actually us going to the places and meeting people face to face and capturing sounds and experiencing a part of their lives actually (laughs) and so the concept kind of fed back into itself but yeah as a as a producer it was a dream project because it's I'm very enthusiastic about rail travel particularly in certain areas of our country and East Anglia is such a beautiful and diverse magical patchwork of people and landscape and um, industry and history it was kind of yeah basically all the stuff I love just rolled into one so it was great to work on it absolutely brilliant and you're a brilliant location producer you're a really passionate locate you know the the other work that you do with us English Heritage we've done National Trust Historic England in the uh, in the past you've always found yourself going out and exploring these places and recording on location let's just talk about that for a moment why is location recording so special now that we're able to get out of home again what do you love about recording on location Mm. obviously there's the thing about capturing the actual sounds and feel of a place which you just don't get in a studio but the other side of it is speaking to people in a place where they are themselves and when you have a conversation or an interview on location with someone in their hometown or someone able to talk in a space where they're particularly passionate about whatever you're talking to them about you get a different side to the conversation people are more relaxed open because you don't have that sense of it being a live show with a deadline. If you, you book the studio for a certain time and people have to get trains to and from. In all the location stuff I tend to do, when you're speaking to people who were experts in whatever area you're talking to them about or have a passion, they're in a place they love to be. So you're just going to get, you're just going to get a raw sense of that. And that's why I really enjoy location recording. And it's obvious to hear you that you're passionate about the topic and about the area and it's very clear why you were a a choice for presenter on this but how did that work I I I think there would be a fear that if you are both producing and presenting that there's a risk of frankly self-indulgence you know without having somebody there to control you or 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 tell you what to do how did you manage to make that work of doing both those jobs at once Uh, That was really hard, actually, because it's definitely got self-indulgent at points. I was having a really nice time and I was kind of swept away. And, you know, particularly in the writing side of things as well, I tend to, you know, enjoy sort of going off on one and waxing lyrical about something particularly wonderful or or moving. But that's where working with Kerry was so brilliant, because I, I just think obviously we kind of shared things between us before they went anywhere in first mixes. But Kerry's kind of judgment and knowledge of the area and basically kind of editorial now really helped us refine things from the script stage through to the edits, through to just refining things more and more as we go through the, the different stages of mixes to make sure that we're focused on key pieces of content. I think 
What's really hard when you are talking to people face to face is that you get lost in the conversation and you're not aware of what an observer, you shouldn't be aware, really. I think as the presenter shouldn't be necessarily aware of what producer here or someone there is thinking about in, in the moment. You know, obviously different for radio, but with podcasting, we want to be able to make the most of that recording time that we have to allow people to talk in as much depth as they can. And then, you know, so it's, it's very different sort of a live environment where you don't have that edit process afterwards. So, yeah, I think the edit process was completely essential in terms of that, having that distance and having some collaboration, working with Kerry to make sure that we focused on what was important, what was universally interesting and um, got the best out of, of everybody and did our contributors justice. And Kerry, how did that work from your side of that sort of two person team of, of you and Catherine creating that work? Was it particularly labour intensive from your point of view? How Could you describe your input into the process? I just feel so grateful that, that we found Catherine and we found fresh air. You know, we, we had looked around at other places, but when we first spoke to you and then hearing that Catherine already had that knowledge and that passion for our subject and then the way that she went on to approach all the different people, get their interviews and and the way the interviews came back, as Catherine says, when she sent us like the first mixes and things, we were just so happy. We were so pleased that she'd really just delivered exactly what we were hoping to get, you know, a kind of really high quality, kind of just a real in-depth look at our rural branch lines and and I think we've just created something that is going to last for a really long time and and people will look back on and kind of say you know isn't it lovely to hear those voices and those experiences so it was it was a really really lovely project to work on Catherine made it really really easy and yeah collaborated really well with us all the time you know always made sure that we were happy with what was coming through she was really flexible I know there were times when we kind of said oh um, somebody's got in touch with us and they really want to see this angle can can we revisit this so sometimes I think we were a little bit demanding but she was just really accommodating the whole way through and we just really couldn't have asked for more we were so delighted with with the final pieces do you know it was really great to actually to have those things pop up as we went along because we were we were building the story as we went weren't we and then the fab thing about the transition that has happened in people's understanding and willingness to adopt technology to connect meant that okay maybe we didn't get this person when we were on site on location but we were able to do remote interviews with people and kind of make that work because the other thing is even though we were in this relaxed period I mean we weren't to know that further lockdowns were on the way you know it was very much let's go cautiously and you know obviously make sure that we were compliant with every and I'm erring on the side of caution with every kind of health and safety consideration and the way we we recorded things where we recorded things who we recorded with I think it was great that we were able to have those interviews latterly with people via zoom if we needed to put in last bits that just added to the story we wouldn't probably wouldn't have been able to get those people to do that <laughs> previously when they're they've got busy lives and they're not naturally using Zoom as a communications medium or happy to talk over internet. So I think that kind of the level of willingness there meant it was possible to be more flexible from from a production end. And how did that process evolve? Did you start off with a, a clear kind of wish list, Kerry, of where you wanted to go and who you wanted to speak to uh, as this sort of overall narrative it did end up actually really full so many people on the wish list so many places on the wish list and only kind of 30 minutes or so that we were aiming for for each podcast so I can't remember if we ended up going over in some instances or not but we really really tried to squeeze so much into them didn't we (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they were packed. I think we kind of said it at the first stages. We went, what if we had one day per line and we had a real time journey? Because that's what we wanted it sound like conceptually as well. We wanted the listener to go on that journey. And what if we coordinated everybody down that line to be waiting at the stop the moment we disembarked? And, you know, in some cases that actually nearly happened. But there was a little bit of juggling and staying in hotels, <laughs> but not so much. Do you know what was also really cool about that uh, approach, Kerry, was at the same time I was down recording around East Anglia, There was a very well-known television production filming their take on East Anglia. And every time I went to some of the bigger sites, so of course, like when we're reflecting a sense of an area and place, then you want to go to like those big 
hotspots the tourists have heard of and know that's you know that's kind of par for the course that's what all the big production companies are going to do but we weren't doing that we were there to tell a story of what it means to live in a place and meet the people there that you wouldn't hear of if you didn't live there yourself maybe you'd meet them in passing as a tourist so in aiming to kind of give that flavor I think what we ended up doing was something really unique from the traditional kind of documentary format where you just go and tick off that site, that site, that site. But we couldn't feature everything. And so we tried to be a little more selective and a little unusual in our choices just to give listeners something that they might not also have experienced of these places and and add a bit of depth to the kind of general understanding. Because we're speaking to a national audience if we're talking to people who are planning their travel to the area or have maybe even never been before. So... Yeah, I thought that evolved really nicely. The other end of the process then, Catherine, you mentioned it, of, of the having gathered loads of stuff. And, I, and I, it's, it's very easy with this type of project to go on a lovely journey, meet loads of brilliant people, gather loads of stuff, and then give yourself a real nightmare afterwards of trying to cut that down and trying to turn that into a story. So how did that balance work? Because you obviously set off knowing kind of what you want pe- people to say. But did you then end up with hours and hours that you had to trawl through? Did you have a very disciplined process between you of cutting that down? How did that work? So we naturally did end up with a lot more than we could feature in these programmes. I was having this conversation with someone yesterday when I was doing another location recording. It was their first podcast into and they said, we talked for an hour. How are you going to make that fit to seven minutes? And I went, well... (laughs) <laughs> and actually I didn't I hardly needed to answer because someone I'd worked with previously as an interview guest came up and said you'd be amazing how it gets cut down and and you can't figure out what's been taken out and it is true because if you think of natural conversation like that's your first thing isn't it kind of removing all those thoughtful moments or bits where you know like a bus goes by and that sort of thing where you kind of stop and start and grab a coffee whatever so there's all, all that stuff it always comes down to the point at the end where you're making really hard decisions and that's where you definitely need you know, more than one person, especially if you, you know, you've been the presenter as well. You definitely need more than one person to discuss what to leave in and what to take out because you need to always bear in mind the, the range of people who are listening and what also not just what their perception is going to be of an interview in isolation because we are kind of montaging all of these pieces, but actually how it's going to sound as a full show and their experience of listening, you know, are they going to get be really tired by the end of it? So. Kerry, did you, so did you have to be very brutal in that sort of final edit no i mean i we also brought in our community rail partnership officers um sort of nearer to the end as well to get their take on everything and they kind of helped with that kind of final thing of you know did did everything fit together well have we included everyone is there anything missing and that that kind of thing so that you know there was actually quite a lot of people (laughs) inputting into that i remember i think you um actually provided us with transcripts catherine for them which actually really helped because you could I mean, not only could you then listen, but you could read through as well. And that kind of sometimes really helped you to see where you kind of thought, well, that's maybe there's some repetition there or this bit goes on a bit too long. So that was really, really useful. So, yeah, no, I mean, I I don't I didn't ever feel like we had to be too brutal. I think a lot of the really lovely bits just really stood out. I think that's worth saying, actually. It's worth explaining the transcript for those who are interested. What we always do with the client is when we have the first cut we provide that with an automated transcript just a computer generated transcript which becomes the feedback document so it allows you as a client to as you say listen through read the transcript at the same time chop out all the bits that you don't want highlight things that you want moving around even highlight things that you think are worth using for promotional activity and then that's just an iterative process based on the transcript it's it's a really as you say a really useful tool carry and it means that we're no longer having you know we don't have emails where someone says oh can you cut out from 1526 through to 1545 please we've all got the transcript we all understand what that means it's a it's a really handy tool and then transcripts for the final cut what we do these days is get a, a human generated transcript that's 100 percent accurate that we can then put on the website which works for seo it's a brilliant tool for accessibility for those who have hearing difficulties so all that content is there both in written form and in audio form as part of the final product it's a great tool isn't it catherine from a producer's point of view as well the transcript 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it helps, as you say, it takes out that kind of uncertainty when it comes to time codes and it actually speeds things up for the client. So everyone has a, a faster process and you can action feedback more accurately and, and quickly. Also, that, that paper edit you do before you even... In some cases, I don't think we did it with this one, actually, just because of the fact that sometimes I think like it's easier to get in, especially if it's quite fresh in your mind to get into an edit not long after and kind of just work through the conversation you've had and and select it that way. But sometimes if you are coming to something cold as a producer, actually having a transcript there in front of you helps you quickly understand the subject and almost do an edit before you've done the edit. (laughs) Really important to say what we always really, really want to encourage from a client point of view is listen at the same time as reading. Things sound so different from the, the written page and it's it's very it's very difficult to just edit on paper. We have had clients in the past who clearly haven't listened to the audio and have cut out chunks and, and it might mean that you end up cutting mid-sentence when it doesn't really make any sense you're sort of getting as Catherine says the cadence of the conversation wrong if you're if you're not listening as well so it's it's really important that they're they're done in tandem that you read and listen at the same time so Carrie from a promotional point of view I know that Covid got in the way a lot of promotion it was a real restriction on what you were able to shout about what you were able to push particularly during lockdown because you were essentially not allowed to promote people traveling during that period weren't you so when it came to promotion what sort of tools did you use how did you shout about it yeah so so um during the the lockdowns and when we had travel restrictions and people couldn't travel our aim was really to put them out on uh, we promoted them through our social media channels and also through the community rail partnerships social media channels i think we also did some promotional work through the local media and i mean during the lockdowns they they received over a thousand listens so you know we we were really happy with that because we couldn't really go all out as much as we wanted to kind of really shout about them but they did kind of achieve the objective that we wanted of kind of you know keeping up our visibility during a time when we couldn't push travel and kind of giving people that escapism while they were in lockdown and just setting that seed of of being able to travel on those lines at some point in the future and the feedback that we got um, for them was was absolutely brilliant you know they went down really really well and people were getting in touch with us to say how much they enjoyed listening to them and the plan now that restrictions have lifted is is that we will be able to put some paid social media promotion behind them and hopefully kind of increase their reach even further. I think that was something that we kind of uh, were bearing in mind throughout with the content creation as well, that we wanted these things to be evergreen, to have some kind of permanence to them. And so we that's we deliberately didn't mention COVID in the recordings. We were making these for a time when we could be beyond it. And also but so that people could escape that a little bit at the time of listening. So. Yeah, you've built up a library of evergreen content there, haven't you? A, a, a sort of a, a box set of content that, and people may just choose to listen to the branch line that they're interested in. They may be pulled in for all manner of reasons in the next couple of years. And you've got beautiful audio content that they will discover for a long time to come I'm sure yeah that's it I feel like we've got it forever now it's just such a lovely way to kind of pay tribute to those lines and all the work that people do on them so to finish off then Kerry from your point of view any tips or insights that you would give somebody who was looking to do the same in your position what have you learned along the way yeah I think Working with a professional production company was just fantastic for us and it meant that we got really high quality content. If we'd have tried to do do something like that ourselves, we just it's not something we could have begun to try and achieve. As a result of that, we've got a really brilliant product. We can use it for a long time now to keep promoting those lines. I would just really recommend everyone to to give it a go. I mean, when we looked at doing it, we we thought it would be a bit of an experiment really to see how it would go down but it but it did really pay off and, and the feedback was absolutely fantastic so I think we know now that we have got an audience out there who who are receptive to our podcast and who do want to hear about the railway in the region and that's given us now the kind of impetus to start looking at, at doing some some different podcasts you know some more sort of uh, behind the scenes of the railway type type ones so yeah I just I, it has proved to be a really good medium for us it's something additional that we can add into our communications mix and it's just another format one that's growing in popularity so I'm really pleased that we kind of took the chance on it and yeah paid off for us fantastic 
And Catherine, from your point of view, you know, projects that are trying to illustrate sense of place, meet characters, tell stories. From a producer's point of view, what insight can you bring? <laughs> there was so much insight on this project just because of the circumstances we were working in. I'd say just let people talk in the <laughs> let people talk in the place that they're most passionate, the places they live, and you will get the most compelling stories. Brilliant. Thank you both very much indeed. For anyone who's interested, it's called Lives on the Lines. It's available on all podcast platforms. It's a podcast full of characters. It's passionately produced, passionately presented, as you can hear. And it is from a train company. And you may not have expected that in the first place. So thank you very much to Kerry Worrell, PR consultant on behalf of Greater Anglia Media Team, to Catherine Kerr, senior producer and presenter from Fresh Air. And if you'd like to find out how you can make great podcasts for your brand or business, you can find us at freshairproduction.co.uk. In the meantime, I'm Neil Cowley. Thank you very much for listening. Fresh Air.